Hello, I'm Andy Priestner and I'm here today to give you a run through of the plagiarism, referencing and academic integrity session that I led together with Meg Westbury in Michaelmas term. Um, the reason why we're, we're putting this together today is in case you missed the session or if you'd like a reminder as to what constitutes plagiarism here at the University of Cambridge and what the rules of referencing are here at Judge. Um, the reason why we teach this session is because every year there are plagiarism incidents at Judge. Um, it's quite surprising how many there are and we'd really like to make a change. Okay, so moving into the session and what, what we covered. Um, first of all, what is plagiarism? We asked you all in the audience what it is and every time we came back with the right answer, essentially the practice of using the ideas or words of others and presenting them as your own, or words to that effect. Now the University of Cambridge's definition is slightly more formal as you'd expect, I'll just go through that, submitting as one's own work, irrespective of intent to deceive that which derives in part or in its entirety from the work of others without due acknowledgement. It is both poor scholarship and a breach of academic integrity. So we started off the session in class with um, an exercise to find out what your plagiarism score was. So we'll just run through that again now to give you a flavour of, of the, the ideas that came out of that, the discussion and the scores, because it was fun. So we asked, what is your plagiarism score? And then went, ran through six different types of plagiarism, the key types. Number one, quoting verbatim another person's work without acknowledging the source. Two, paraphrasing another person's work by changing some of the words or the order of the words without acknowledging again. Three, using ideas without reference to the person who had the ideas in the first place. So it's ideas as well as word and text. Four, cutting and pasting from the internet. Five, submitting someone else's work as your own. And finally, colluding with a classmate on a piece of work when that work is not permitted to be a joint piece of work. That happens more often than you think. So there, are this, there were the six different types. We asked everyone to get into groups and to discuss them. And in groups of three or four, um, students came up with a total score with each one of those um, misdemeanors counting as a point. So a group of three could have 18 as their total plagiarism score. So um, the scores that came out um, weren't that surprising. They were quite low because everyone was sharing, um, you know, sharing in front of other people. It was early on in term. People didn't want to be sh shown up to be plagiarists, obviously. But um, I think there wasn't a great deal of honesty. I think the best we got out of any group was, was 12 out of 18, a score of 12. So that had been quite a lot of plagiarism going on. If I'd had a, a prize, I would have given it to that team because they were the most honest. Um, another session we taught... Um, we had, I think, the highest score was about two or three. So, um, yeah, it's interesting what people will, will volunteer in front of other people. But what was more interesting and fun than the score was really the discussion that arose from that initial interaction about plagiarism. And what were the questions that were going through the audience's mind? Well, I think most importantly was, um, how much do I have to reference? When does it become irritating to the person who's reading it when there's a reference um, regularly? Um, you know what exactly is the rule there and, and how can I find my voice? So some of the questions went beyond the rules of plagiarism and, and referencing. There's also discussion about um, when does group work become collusion, um, which we'll cover within this session today. So it was, it was interesting to have that discussion with you all and, and get the balls rolling on, on, on what constitutes plagiarism. And the fact that it is a grey area, it's not straightforward. So we went through the scores. Meg and I then had a brief interlude where we talked about why is there more plagiarism today? Um, is this just something that we feel? We came through with some of the reasons why we think this is the case. Um, th these are just some of them um, that you can see on the screen now. Um, we kind of feel like the way that everyone studies is different. It's all to do with accessibility of information on the internet. The fact that there's so much more out there. I, I guess um, the feeling that um, information is free. All these different things to come together and it's so much easier to cut and paste from different places and forget where you got things from. So it all comes together to, to make plagiarism more possible, more of a problem, a potential pitfall. Of course, not all plagiarism that takes place is intentional. And I think this is an important distinction to make. Is the plagiarism intentional or unintentional? Well, if we return to the University of Cambridge definition, we'll see that the university actually doesn't care whether you intended to do it or not because there's an important phrase which they actually introduced to this definition um, about two years ago. It's 
fairly new. And that phrase is irrespective of intent to deceive. So regardless of whether you intended to plagiarise or not, it's still plagiarism. So you must be very careful about that. So moving on to why do people intentionally plagiarise? So in the class, we asked everyone to come up with ideas. And the reasons we came up with were laziness, Lack of confidence. People might not feel that what they're writing is good enough and therefore use other people's um, work. You might want a good grade, of course. Find referencing too difficult, so you don't bother. You think no one will find out. There was a varsity survey um, a few years ago in which I think 49% of people who, who fit, completed the survey said that they'd um, plagiarised before. And the reason why they'd done it is because they thought no one will find out. Well, I'll tell you here and now that there are measures in place that will ensure that you actually will be found out and, you know, there's various software in place. But also, I think people um, mistake the intelligence of people actually marking their papers. You know, if your voice is different, if there's not enough references, it'll be obvious that you've plagiarised. And lack of time is another important issue. So what about um, a case here at Judge? Well... The example I want to show you of intentional plagiarism is um, an essay that was submitted on travel retailing in Spain. Um, now this great titters in the audience from this because it's the text in red which is actually the plagiarised text, which is pretty incredible. So it's not just intentional plagiarism, it's, it's abject stupidity really. Um, that all the text in red had just been copied direct from a database and um, just been plonked into an essay obviously not their usual writing style. Give them some credit, they came up with the first line themselves, that line in black, it has been a difficult period for the travel retailing industry in Spain. But there, were, there was data, there was information throughout that text which needed references, and the person hadn't had the sense to, you know, even port over the references from that article. It was just completely there as if, you know, they'd done all this research, but there was, there was no references there at all. So it was really easy to pick up this particular, in, um, this particular instance. So moving on to why do people unintentionally plagiarise? Thankfully, this is, this is more common. Um, so what might the reasons be? You don't know how or when to reference. That's part of the reason for this video, to, to give you the toolkit. You might merge views, your views with those of the writer. So you read something and after a while you, you've really embraced that and you think, yeah, this is great, I really get this stuff. And suddenly it becomes your own words, your own ideas, and you forget where you read it, and you forget that actually you need to reference the original source. You might make poor notes, um, particularly um, now that we've got the web and you're just moving between different pages. You might not always print out stuff you've written, um, that you've, you've read, rather. There are different cultural practices that, can, um, that are at play as well. So in the country you might come from, there might be a different rule about plagiarism. Oh. Well, this, this presentation is about plagiarism here in the UK and at Cambridge. And finally, you might not realise you're colluding. And this is the case that I want to have a look at here, here and now. Oh, lack of time as well. So here at Judge, I want to tell you a little story about two students who got on very well together. Um, a guy and a gal who were very bright and intelligent and enthusiastic. And we were very surprised to discover that they'd actually been had up on a charge of plagiarism. We found out later on um, that they'd been um, charged with plagiarism in terms of the collusion that had taken place on a project that they submitted. Now, we were surprised because, um, you know, they really didn't seem like the type, but maybe like so many areas of life, you can't tell if someone is a plagiarist or not by, by looking at them. Um, in fact, um, they had worked very innocently together. They, they, you know, fired ideas off each other. They were certain that what they were doing wasn't plagiarism. They were just working together. And it just so happened that their work translated, the working together translated into a project that was a joint effort. And there was tables that were shared, there, were, um, there was text that was the same between the different essays. And they didn't think to ask an academic whether that was okay. And when it was actually came to being submitted, um, there was duplication of text, there was just duplication of data, and there was no recognition of the fact that either of them, you know, that this data was shared between those essays. And so it was a serious case of plagiarism, it was regarded as collusion. And what they absolutely should have done is talk to the academic in question, talk to the course office and found out whether it was okay to do this or whether in fact it would be regarded as plagiarism. And all too often it, a judge, it is this collusion story that we hear again and again. 
Um, it's very easy to do. So if you're in any doubt, do ask. Yeah. This is more common, and it's the sort of stuff that, um, this, this slide now, it's the sort of stuff that happens all the time. It's when you're adding stuff to your essays and you actually need references, and it's just not referenced enough. There's I reference to ideas, to thoughts, to people. The example here on the slide is Haifetz, who's writing about adaptive leadership. And the text in red here, really there should be references in, in all these different places, um, in text citations, saying where this information came from whether it was um, from a, a book chapter or an article. Um, the reason being that it's obvious that the person writing it didn't come up with these ideas themselves. They need, they need to reference where they came from. And Board of Examiners have come back to the school quite regularly to say, look, do you actually teach your guys referencing? Because there's just not enough references in these essays. And yeah, that, that's, a, that's something that we really need to take seriously. You need to take seriously. And if you reference any idea or anyone else's text, then you must actually include an in-text reference. It may seem straightforward and simple, but you know people don't do it enough. OK, so I'm now going to hand over to Meg, who's going to tell you how you can avoid being charged with plagiarism. Hi, this is Meg. Andy just covered what plagiarism is, and now I'm going to cover how you can avoid being charged with plagiarism. As we discussed in the class, it's actually not that hard the way you do it is by citing and referencing appropriately. So I'm going to take some time right now to discuss the basic rules of formatting your citations and your references. Essentially what it comes down to is two things. In the text of your writing, you need what's called an in-text citation. After any time you use words or ideas that are not your own, you need to include the author, the year, and the page number from the source that those ideas or words came from. Then at the end of your paper, in a list of references, you need to include all the information about that source so that your reader can then go locate the source if he or she chooses. So as we discussed, anything that you cite within the text of your paper needs to be referenced at the end, and if anything appears in your references list, it needs to actually be cited within the text of your paper. So here's an example of how it can be done. Here, this is a direct quote. Essentially, when writing, you need to acknowledge the hard work of the scholars on whose work you are drawing, in parentheses, the author's last name, Parker, the year it was written, and the page number, in parentheses. Another way you can do this is by separating out the author's last name, so putting the author's last name, and then the date and the page number within parentheses. As long as the name and the year are right next to each other, you're fine. So in this case, it's at the front of the sentence. Parker stated that essentially when writing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Then at the end of your paper, so this is a paraphrase of the writing. So when you're using the work of other scholars, you need to acknowledge this in your writing. And again, Parker, 2009, page 147. At the very end, you have a list of references. <clears throat> in this case, everything about the, the resource so that your reader can then go find the resource, such as the author, the year, the entire title, edition, place it was published, and the press. Okay. So I want to move on a little bit to paraphrasing at this point, because as we discussed in class, you'll be doing some direct quoting of people's works, but more often than not, you're going to be rewriting people's ideas into your own words, and that's called paraphrasing. So learning how to paraphrase properly um, and doing it well is an important part of, of your academic career. So let's, let's take a few minutes to recap the essentials of paraphrasing. So if you recall, we showed you an example of a quote from the Cambridge Alumni Magazine about the Judge Institute. So just read it very quickly now to refresh your memory. Okay, now that's the direct quote from the Alumni Magazine. This is my attempt at paraphrasing the quote. So go ahead and take a look at it at my paraphrase. Now, if you recall from the class, we asked, does it constitute plagiarism? And actually, you are all so good. Most of you s said very clearly that yes, indeed, it does constitute plagiarism. And the reason why is because essentially, my paraphrase used the same words, the same phrasing, even the same sentence order. It's a very, very poor rewrite. Essentially, it's copied, but without the quotation marks. And most importantly, 
it's lacking a reference. So it doesn't even say who wrote it, what page number, etc. Very clear cut case of plagiarism. Now, you can avoid that charge of plagiarism by actually doing a very good sound paraphrase. So here's the example that we covered in class. Sarah Woodward, 1997, page 61, thought that the Judge Business School's walkways and balconies felt theatrical, as well as putting her in mind of Escher. Although she regarded the overall looks as exciting, she did wonder if it was all a little vulgar. So you see there, the ideas are there, but it's really a complete rewrite. Now, another option, which is actually not a paraphrase, but kind of gets you around the, the direct quote plagiarism issue, is by peppering in some bits of pieces of the direct quote. And then, of course, at the very end of your paper, you've got the list of references to Sarah Woodward. Um, and that's the complete reference to that one particular article. Okay, so if it's all this simple, where does it all go wrong? How does it all go wrong if it's just a matter of putting in citations and references? Well, as we discussed in class, there are numerous examples. Laziness, you merge your views with those of the writer all of you are extremely smart people. It's sometimes it's difficult to see where your brilliant ideas start and somebody else's ended. You honestly think nobody's going to find out. You have a lack of time. And you make poor notes. This last point is actually a point that I'd like to cover in a little bit more depth right now because um, effective note taking is really the cornerstone of good essay and research paper writing. And unless you get it right from the get go, um, your papers really are going to fail. And it's poor note taking that may be the number one cause of unintentional plagiarism. So let's cover that right now. Your notes, um, especially your paraphrases of other people's ideas are really the building blocks of your paper, um, as I mentioned before. And it's a bit like warming up before a marathon. You've got to warm up before the marathon. You've got to make sure your notes are in order before you actually start writing. But good note taking ahead of time will make sure that your paper just kind of writes itself when it comes time to write. So number one for effective note taking, always note down your source title, author, year, and page numbers first. Do not just barrel in and start scribbling down notes or typing down notes. Always note down where it came from. Be absolutely meticulous about noting if something is a direct quote or your own words, yeah? It's extremely important to make, put some notations in the, in the margins or something or huge quotation marks. And if you photocopy your work or if you look at a website, be extremely careful to note down page numbers or the URL that the, that the website came from and of course the date that you access the website because you're going to need all of that information for the reference at the end. A solid piece of advice, make sure your notes are neat and well spaced because if you can't read them, you're not going to be able to do much with them. This is a good piece of advice. Consider going through your notes straight away to show relationships between ideas. Take just five minutes over coffee after you do your notes and you'll be amazed at how many connections you make in your mind. Also, Try to write down ideas that are only for the assignment at hand. Uh, we're all, you are very, very smart people and you have a lot of ideas in your head, but it's very important when you're taking notes for a particular assignment, not to go off on a major tangent. That'll keep your notes far more organized. So a piece of software that I think facilitates this note taking process is called Evernote. As we talked about in class, a whole bunch of you are actually are already using Evernote to, um, to capture lecture notes or interesting things that you see when you're out and about. Um, Evernote, just to recap, is a piece of cloud software that stores your notes in the cloud. It's very robust. It's been around for about five years. Um, and what you can do is easily create a note. You can tag it with keywords. You can add a URL to it. Obviously, you add a date to it. Um, and then you can send those notes up to your Evernote account and you can access them from any computer in the world. Um, if you've got a mobile phone, you can actually take a picture with something and send it up to Evernote as well. So it's just a great way of taking notes and keeping track of them and then being able to pull them all together when it comes time to write the assignment. And then we also talked about when it comes time to organize the ideas for your assignment, mind mapping software is actually an excellent option. Um, we talked about MindMeister as being a free online mind mapping tool, and there are others out there as well. But it just allows you to put ideas and rearrange them around on the page until you feel like you've got the correct order. And when it comes time to write your paper, 
the ideas just kind of, the paper just kind of writes itself because you're organized ahead of time. Finally, as we talked about in class, um, there's a piece of software called Zotero that will make this entire process of managing your citations and references so incredibly easy. Gone are the days where you manually have to type in your citation and your reference and make sure that you get all of the parentheses and periods and italics correct, because this handy free piece of open source software will actually do it for you. It's called Zotero. And what will happen is if it recognizes something on your database or your web page where there's metadata about a particular source, it will you just click a little button, it will automatically put all that information into the Zotero database. Um, we prefer to run it as an add-on to Firefox, but you can actually run it as a standalone version as well. Um, and when it comes time to write your paper, uh, you, you just add the little add-in for Word, and it also works with OpenOffice and quite seamlessly with Macs as well. And um, it just makes your citations and references for you. Now, before we launch into the demonstration of Zotero, I just want to make clear that the kind of referencing style that's preferred here by the Cambridge Judge Business School is called the Harvard referencing style. It's basically a very simple date name format that many of you are probably quite familiar with. Now, it's the preferred style here, but it's not the only style that's accepted. If you're quite familiar with another style, such as the Chicago style or the MLA style, for example, you're perfectly welcome to continue to use it as long as you use it consistently throughout your work here. But the examples that I'm going to be showing you now are what are called the Harvard style. And in fact, in your packet of handouts, just to recap, we had a handy handout that covered the basic examples of how to do the Harvard referencing style. I'll also be talking about um, an online reference source that covers all the examples that you would ever need for this, this particular style as well. Okay, so let me show you Zotero. I've installed Zotero as an add-on for Firefox, and when I do that, it, as you recall, it kind of moves into the lower right-hand pane of my web browser. I'm now going to go ahead and open up one of the databases that we have here. As we discussed in class, Business Source Complete is a really great place to begin your business research. I'm going to do a search for business ethics. And I'm going to go say, the, I'm going to check the box for scholarly journals, and I'm going to go ahead and say search. Now notice up here in my browser bar that a little yellow folder appeared. That's because Zotero recognizes there are some articles of interest on this page. I can click that folder, and then I can tick the ones that I want to be downloaded into Zotero. Once I say OK, all of those are now saved down to my library. Okay, and in this case, it was just a citation record, but if there had actually been the full text of an article there, the PDF would have come down as well, which is very, very handy. Now, when I'm ready to write, I go over to my Word document. Actually, let me show you Zotero very quickly. I'm clicking Zotero on the right-hand corner. This shows my Zotero database. If I click on any of these resources here, you notice off to the right, is all the information about that resource. And you can edit this as you need to, because sometimes not all the information comes down or there's a little bit of a typo in it. So you do need to review it quickly before you move on. When you're ready to write, you bring up your Word document or your open office document, type some text. And when you're ready to add a citation in, um, if you recall, you go to the add-ins tab and you go over to the add citation button. Now. The very first time you do this, you need to choose your style. The style I'm choosing is the Harvard Cambridge Judge Business School style, which is actually not a default that comes with Zotero. However, on our website, as we discussed in class, the style is located there, and you can easily download it and install it into Zotero. All the instructions are there for how to do that. I'm going to go ahead and say OK and choose it. And then I'm going to go ahead and choose my, my citation. And I say, OK. And then this is more text. OK. And then I'm going to go ahead and add another citation in. OK. There they all are in really nice format. Now, to add it, you need to manually add the page number in yourself because, of course, Zotero doesn't know which page number from the source the, the information came from. But it's easy to add that in. And when you're ready to add your list of references at the end, just go ahead and click the add references button 
and Zotero will put it in automatically for you. Isn't that amazing? You didn't have to do anything yourself. And it's all in the perfect preferred style for the school. And this is a bit more text. Now look at this. I'm going to add one more citation in to my text. And notice that Zotero just automatically added it to my list of references without my even needing to ask it to. So it's a very clever piece of software. It's free, easy to use. In about 20 minutes, you can be completely up and running with it. We do provide some documentation in your handout pack, if you recall, and there's some really, really good documentation online as well. As I mentioned earlier, we actually have an e-resource called Cite Them Right, which will cover every example of how to cite and reference in the Harvard style. Any kind of resource you can possibly be dealing with, from traditional articles and books, to websites, blogs, tweets, musical scores, pers um, personal communications, almost anything you can think of will be covered in this e-resource. There's a link to that e-resource on our blog post about plagiarism, which I'll show at the end. But there's also on the back of the business card that you got in class, there's a link to this. And there's a link in our databases A to Z page as well. So it's a great resource if you're ever stuck for how to create a reference for a particular kind of source. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Andy now, who's going to cover some frequently asked questions. Okay, thanks, Meg. So I'm going to cover some frequently asked questions, the first of which is readability. Um, you do need to think about the faculty member who's going to be marking your essay. Um, you don't want, they don't want to read a reference every other word. Um, but having said that, at the same time, if you're using someone else's text or ideas or words, then you absolutely do have to reference them. So it's a question of maybe thinking about how you paraphrase, whether you're adding, adding in your own commentary or opinion. Um, we can't tell you how to write your essays, but we can tell you that referencing is very important, that you must do it when it's appropriate to do so. But you do need to think about readability. So that's number one. Number two, common knowledge. So things like the world is round, Einstein's theory of relativity, you don't need to put any reference in for those. Um, also within business and management, that's the sector you're, you're researching in now and you're studying in. So there's areas of business and management that you don't need to reference, such as, um, say, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a, is a good example, or Hertzberg's hygiene factor in the same area of motivation and morale. They're things that everyone really knows about, so you don't really need to put a reference. But um, if you're in doubt, it's always good to put a reference in, but there are some areas which you could consider to be common knowledge. Now, it is a little bit of a grey area because everyone's common knowledge is different, but um, it's up to you to make that judgment call. But um, I would say that very few people have been you know, brought up for plagiarism on the basis that something could be interpreted as common knowledge or no. It, it just doesn't happen. Um, the third point is secondary referencing. So this is, should I go back to the original source um, and, and reference that if I'm talking about the ideas or, or, or thoughts that they'd had? Um, the answer is yes. Really, ideally, you should. But if that first original text is not available to you, it's fine to use a secondary source which cites that and to cite that instead. That's absolutely fine. It's a question we get regularly. Finally, auto-plagiarism. So this is when you submit work that you've done elsewhere, uh, an essay, an assignment, and submit it as if you've never done it elsewhere before. Um, you know, pass it off as new. You can't do that. That is auto-plagiarism. And yeah, it's against the rules. Okay. Question you might have, um, certainly those people who filled in that varsity survey, they thought, well, no one's going to find out. No one really takes plagiarism that seriously here. Well, they absolutely do. And this is how you will be found out, one of the following ways. It could be that the academic reading your work sees that the writing style of your essay is completely different, either to essays you've written previously or to style elsewhere in your essay. So someone else's voice is going to be really obvious. It's quite easy to pick this stuff up. Um, Lack of references. That example of the travel retailing industry, um, that was initially picked up because there was references, um, there was data in there that, um, the, rather there was data that should have had references associated with it. And it was all just there in one block of text. It was really obviously not someone's work. Um, yeah, lack of references is often a telltale sign. Plagiarism software. There is Turnitin that is used here uh, to judge. It's not used to um, put every essay through. Um, but what it is essentially is it's plagiarism software which detects matches of words, phrases with um, information that's out there on the web and also on library databases. So it will look for, for matches of phrases, of paragraphs 
and it will give an overall plagiarism score for that piece of work. So something might be 64% plagiarised. Um, let's hope not, but it, you know it does happen. Um, so it's academics have access to plagiarism and they may use it. Um, I know on certain programmes there is a random number of essays that are fed through Turnitin. Certainly if there's a query about plagiarism, then an essay would be put through plagiarism electronically and it would be checked again for matches with other materials. So there are various means by which you'll be found out. And finally, text duplication and familiarity. So this is in the case of collusion, where a faculty member has read several essays and thinking, well, hey, that looks familiar. And it's because it's the same text as someone else has used. So either it's been copied without the other person's knowledge or it's an issue of collusion, which we've already covered. So what are the consequences? Well, the first, um, the first I'd like to talk about is a percentage um, reduction of your marks. So that is, faculty have perfectly within their rights to... If they think an essay is, say, 20% plagiarised, they'll take 20% off your marks. Yeah, you know, it, it's simple as that, and they can do that. It's a subjective decision. The second thing would be a formal investigation here with the course director, um, the, um, the people in the course office, and yourself to defend an, an instance of plagiarism. Um, if that is not resolved there and then, um, then it might go to the next stage, which is the Court of Discipline, which is presided over by the university proctors. And this is the place where, you know, you don't want to go there. And this is where you could have your degree um, taken away from you, not conferred, because of a serious incident of plagiarism. Now, most incidents don't get that far, but, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them do, sadly. Um, so, you know, it's something to be avoided at all costs. You don't want to get to the first stage, obviously. OK, I'm going to pass you on to Meg again now, who's going to wrap up by talking about academic integrity. So Andy just covered a little bit about what can potentially happen to you if you plagiarize. So up to now, we've been talking about plagiarism, about rules and about things that you shouldn't do. And, that, and in some ways, those are sort of externally ex, um, imposed rules. But what I want to talk about and recap what we talked about in class is a little bit about the personal reasons why you should always try to do the right thing. What's in it for you if you don't plagiarize? Well, instead of copying and becoming a talented copyist, if you paraphrase correctly, you'll actually develop your academic voice and become an authoritative um, source about particular topics. And really the only way you can get there, the only way you can become an informed, opinionated person on certain topics and become an expert on those topics is by reworking those ideas yourself and becoming a good paraphraser. Um, the other reason is that here at Cambridge, the academic tradition is to base your work on the scholarship of others. And so you absolutely need to acknowledge the work of the giants um, who have come before you. And then add your own, of course, but you need to acknowledge the work that's come before you. And finally, by deceiving you, you, you do potentially taint the reputation of this course. And as we discussed in class, because there have been some plagiarism um, cases in the past, questions have been asked about the course. Um, anytime there's any sort of academic dishon dishonesty, it really taints the entire reputation of, this, of your course and the school in general. So the golden rule when in doubt, reference, reference, reference. If it's not your idea, and if it's not your words, you absolutely need to say where it came from. And that's the golden rule. And if you do that, you're highly like to, likely to avoid any charge of plagiarism. Now, all of these are, all of the handouts, all of the um, examples that we gave today, all of the websites, including Zotero and the citation style for Zotero are located on our blog and we have a we have a new piece up there called advice on plagiarism and you can get to it from the quick link section and it's just got an entire recap of this entire talk including the slides as well so it's always right there at your fingertips but thank you very much for listening and um, if you have any questions don't feel afraid to come to us at the information center or contact us and we'd be happy to help out